Yo, what's up guys? So as you can see, the lighting isn't perfect, 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 but <clears throat> um, just gonna go ahead and do it. Um, I've, I've already started and I've already wanted to stop. So let's get back into it. If this is your first video watching, uh, we're going through this book, um, Your Speech Reveals Your Personality. And uh, um, it's written by a doctor, um, Dr. Barbara, keep forgetting my man's name here. <clears throat> um, uh, Dominic Barbara, Dr. Dominic Barbara. <clears throat> and, um, yeah, it's a really cool book. I've, um, a playlist where you could check out all the other uh, chapters and sections of the book. So right now this is going to be part two of chapter one. Chapter one is entitled uh, The Formidable Imprints of Speech. The Formidable Imprints of Speech. And um, so yeah. Uh, I have the radio playing in the background. Hopefully it's not too loud. And so we're just going to get started in part two of chapter one um yeah again this is uh your speech reveals your personality the culture of society <clears throat> the culture or society in which we live has placed a definite imprint on our means of communication in our western culture where the emphasis on verbal expression plays such a dominant role it is not difficult to understand the conflicting tendencies in anxieties that result in relation to speaking. Give me one second, guys. I'm about to uh, I'm about to change this. Uh... <laughs> Let's lower the volume real quick. Cause it's bothering me, and I don't know if it's going to bother you. All right. <clears throat> right. It is to some extent because of this factor that we have such a marked prevalence of stutterers. A whole bunch of emphasis is, 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 is placed on speaking and verbal expression. And uh, this doctor is saying, maybe, you know, no wonder why we have a lot of people that stutter. Uh, whereas in those cultures where less stress is placed on the importance of the spoken word, the tendency toward stuttering has been greatly diminished. That's really interesting and fascinating, right? <clears throat> and uh, I know for me, which is really interesting, um, oftentimes in English, I do still stutter. However, in Creole, um, the language I kind of grew up, um, I learned Creole and English at the same time and probably learned more. And it was a little bit ahead with my Creole than my English. And so, but like my parents were strict, were like extremely strict extremely strict and so whenever communicating with them in creole i would you know stutter and uh do you know just have different i it, it, it would be it would be really stressful and so i would stutter a whole lot and uh, that actually translated into english when i spoke english but then over the years um i just i just sometimes sort of kind of i i stuttered less overall but for sure stuttered way more or less in English and a bit more in, but still stuttered more in Creole because it's just the stress and the pressure that I felt, right? With the people that I was communicating with in Creole. <clears throat> Recently, Dr. John C. Snydercore, a speech professor at the University of California, and speaking of a several months visit with, among the Shoshon in Bannock Indian tribes of southeastern Idaho reported on personal interviews with 800 full-blooded Indians and on additional statistics from 100,000 others. Not one was a stutter. This is in marked contrast to the 18 to 40, 18 to 40 so afflicted who would have been discovered in a comparable uh, segment of our own society. It is not a course theory that these tribes are free of the speech defect because they have escaped the stutter causing pressures 
of modern civilization. That's really fascinating. <clears throat> they have not, as toddlers, for example, been urged to speak for display purposes, nor is any stigma attached to non-speaking on the part of the adults. An Indian will sit quietly for hours, free of any obligation to give voice to his thoughts. That's crazy. That's really crazy. Um, that's awesome. From such observations as these of Dr. Snyder Core, we may assume that in those cultures where there is freedom of thought and choice of words and less pressure toward verbal communication, the individual will have more security in his forms of expression, and therefore there will be less evidence of disturbed patterns of speech. Too many people today talk too much at times. <laughs> oh my gosh. Too many people today talk too much at times. Go, gu girlless, girlless individuals prate constantly about trivial things, use chit chat, social niceties, and overemphasize everyday nonsense. Wow. Imagine if this guy was alive today. This was published back in the 60s or something, 60s, 70s, 50s. You know what I'm saying? Uh, second printing, 1970. First printing, 58. Imagine if he knew about Twitter, so Facebook, Instagram. Many become loquacious, talking incessantly and boringly on anything. The motivation behind this is usually an anxious sense of insecurity and a neurotic need for approval and social acceptance. Wow. Have me some porridge out here on the side. That's cooling. <clears throat> some plantain porridge. I kind of mixed it with, uh, with some oatmeal. Blended that sucker up. And I burnt it. I'm going to repeat, I'm going to reread that section because this is a, wow. Too many people today talk too much at times. Garless individuals prate constantly about trivial things. Use chit chat, social niceties, and overemphasize everyday nonsense. Many become loquacious, talking incessantly and boringly on anything. The motivation behind this is usually an anxious sense of insecurity and a neurotic you need for approval and social acceptance. That in this age of ideologies and anxieties, people have become increasingly aware of the sensitive role of verbal communication in everyday problems is due to mounting daily complexities and social tensions. It is an awareness that has developed as a result of the existing struggles between nations, the desire among people to relate productively to each other, and our increased dependency on mass communication such as radio, television, electronic devices, newspapers, magazines, and so on. <laughs> oh my gosh, this guy would have been blown away if you if <laughs> if you were alive today, bro. <clears throat> Communication is of prime importance to us because we live in a world of words. Culturally, our spoken and written words become powerful weapons as daily we come under the impact of their use in advertising, politics, religion, propaganda, and how-to books and articles. Wow. Wow. The, the idea just came to me that it's not just individuals that, are, that talk too much in our society sometimes. But it's like organizations, corporations, like we're we're bombarded with an over stimulation from an over usage of words in various forms. In scientific jargon, the written word forms a perplexing, complicated verbiage, a redundant, tautological obfuscation. Tautological obfus, obf, obfuscating, obfuscating, obfuscating. Wow, that's a mouthful. 
a redundant tautological up, up, obfuscating language. Bro, I gotta I gotta look that up. Tautological obfuscating. T A U T O L O G I C A L. Tautological obfuscating. Obfuscating. It's it's just those things are not supposed to be next to each other. Those letters, I swear. O B F U S C A T I N G. Obfuscate. Right? Obfuscating. 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 Tautological obfuscating language to which the term gobbledygook may aptly be applied. It is true, too, that science is forever exploring new horizons, and so strange and unfamiliar terms are constantly being added to our technical vocabulary, necessitating a steady oh, excuse me, flow of revised editions to keep the dictionaries and various other glossaries from becoming obsolete. Chemical, geological, and medical terms that could only have sounded like neologisms, neologisms at the time of their introduction into the language now come to serve as useful references among professional men and even among laity. The word schizophrenic must have seemed strange at first hearing. Today, it is so universally used that we have, we have come to accept an abbreviated version of the word schiz to rhyme with splits. However, until we understand how to use words properly with some order and with, with specific social correlations, we will encourage confused and disorganized communication. To give our language a constructive purpose, therefore, it is essential that we use it almost as if it were a fourth dimension. Since language contains meanings private to the speaker himself, to his listener, and in relation to the thing, relationship, or object spoken or referred to, words are to be understood primarily in the concepts in which they are used with the varied implicit or explicit meanings they tend to imply or convey. Most people think there is a standard kind of American talk that is general, approved, and correct. What's more, these same people at times sincerely believe they speak it, at least when they try to. The fact is, however, that one cannot possibly speak right American because there is no such thing. For instance, comparison of American Indian and English vocabulary shows that in the one language, different words for one object reveal the tendency to think in terms of differences, whereas the all-inclusive words of English are evidence of our emphasis on similarities. The latter, as one can see, leads mainly to rigidity of language usage, black and white thinking, and finally, complexity and confusion of reasoning and emotion. To end at this point, I'm not sure about that though. I'm not sure if that, you know, the um, the all-inclusive words of English are evidence of our emphasis on similarities. If that, well, okay, I see it. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that's just like, like an echo box, right? An echo chamber um, with, 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 with uh, modern day algorithms, right? You just you know, based on similarities, like what you like, what you, the music you like and the different things. And so you never get exposed to like differences. So I, I see it. Yeah. To end at this point for the moment, one might inquire as to what the objectives, aims, goals, or purposes are that man seeks in speaking. Can we refer to or label them as reality searching fact, reality searching, fact finding, evaluative data, experiencing and processing, finding a way of life? Are we searching blindly for the truth? If so, how can we begin to define the word truth? Aldous Huxley has written, This non-human truth that the scientists are trying to get at with their intellects, it's utterly irrelevant to ordinary human living. Our truth, the relevant human truth, is something you discover by living. Living completely with the whole man. This concept of self-realization further engenders and elaborates upon the premises that man's ultimate quest in the search for truth is to discover himself, to find his real self, 
and to realize it to its fullest capacities and possibilities. It is also aims at inner desire in all of us as human beings to communicate this truth to ourselves and to the world about us. And that's it for chapter one. Join me in chapter two, titled Symbols, the Building Blocks of Thought and Experience. Please feel free to leave your comments and questions um, in the section below in the comments. And um, also, just a side note, this is not like I try really not to share a lot of my opinions, but I'm just reading this book. Um, off the back, I, I've i already, you know, I like I realize that the author does not mean the author does not share the same worldview. Uh, and so because of this, we we differ on a lot of different things. So these aren't like my words, my viewpoints I'm reading. And I share like my two cents uh, here and there. But yeah, that's it. So let me know what you guys think. And also uh, stay tuned, man. Join me on the next uh, on the next chapter, chapter two on symbols. All right, guys. Peace out, and hopefully this is helpful. <clears throat>